The stock market is telling us right now that the economic recovery is going to be just about as powerful and swift as the collapse. What do you think? Um, that, I think there are a couple things to keep in mind. One is we've had an extraordinary amount of uh, stimulus. If you add up monetary and fiscal uh, stimulus as a percentage of GDP, it's about 37 percent. That, that's an extraordinary number. So the market is right to respond to that. I think we're going to transition, um, however, from monetary and fiscal stimulus headlines to uh, leading economic indicators and earnings. And that's probably not as uh, positive of a tale in the near term. So as we look out, uh, we think on the equity side right now, uh, things are probably around fair value. Uh, on credit, we see a lot of value. Um, I think you have to divide really from a, an asset allocation and a macro standpoint. W what are you trying to achieve? W when we look out towards 22 and 23, remember most of our capital is kind of seven to 10 year capital. We see a lot of value and we see secular winners around e-commerce, around, um, I would say, value concepts as, as in the uh, people trade down. Um, we think there's going to be a big theme towards nesting or people doing more around their uh, working from home or similar type behavior patterns, what we saw post 9-11. Um, but this is not going to be a straight line. The, the, the VIX is at 40 for a reason, and it's telling you there's still a lot of uncertainty. Um, I think you and I have talked about this uh, recently, but look, the U.S. just lost, unfortunately, you know, and there's a massive human element to, to this. Uh, the U.S. has had 22 million people um, on the unemployment uh, tally in the last four weeks, which is extraordinary by, by any measure. So it's going to be a different recovery by country and by region. We're seeing very attractive green shoots out of China. I don't think China is the playbook for all countries, but I do think that you can say there's going to be a recovery. It's coming, um, but it's going to come from a big hole. Henry, what do the Chinese economic data overnight tell us? I think they tell you two important things. One is the industrial hung in there pretty well uh, because they were still getting uh, decent demand out of the West. I think that's going to slow. But you saw the consumer data, the retail sales, down about 17 percent year over year. And that's probably more reflective of what um, we would expect. I mean, we track this data both, I think, you know, for, for your viewers, we have 175 companies globally where we get pretty good real-time information. You know, China's cases peaked around February the 4th. The economic data there, you know, started to bottom around February the 16th. And we've seen pickup in things like household products, uh, jewelry. Um, we're even seeing autos come back. But it's a very different consumer. And I think one of the things that we outline in our in our piece, that, you know, that uh, folks can take a look at, is that we think this is an inflection point. We think there's some very investable themes uh, to, that are going to change uh, in the playbook. That what people were doing for the last couple of years, um, you know, you'll have to really adjust the way your lens through what you look at the world. I also just want to um, kind of back to your point on the recovery. Remember, there are two things that I think uh, people haven't talked talk about and written enough, about enough, which is um, we came into this 10 years into a recovery where we now have peak corporate margins and we have peak corporate leverage. And you've seen a lot of that through um, you know, people doing buybacks and things like that. So this is somewhat of a combination in our mind of, unfortunately, a, a bolt from the blue shock like we saw with 9-11 but coupled with a, um, an event like 1987. So typically when you get a crash, you get a big bounce right back up. And this, is, this, this market did the right thing. We had the most significant drop since, uh, even since, since the Great Recession ahead of the recession. And that the market was telling you the right thing. We've obviously had a much more dramatic response. I mean, Eric, think about it this way. The Fed has done more in the last two weeks, 85% more in terms of buying than what it did the two weeks after uh, the Lehman bankruptcy in 2008. So we've got better technology between the Fed and the Treasury. Um, our hats are off to them in terms of how they're trying to work from a monetary standpoint and a fiscal standpoint. The offset of that is that the U.S., um, given it's, it's, uh, the way the business works, we have a much higher unemployment rate. So we see very little unemployment trends in, in Asia and China in particular. In Europe, we think unemployment has moved from kind of 7 to 11%. And in the U.S., that number could move, um, could move from kind of where we are today up towards 15 to 20 percent. So can we talk for a moment, Henry, about what the Fed and the Treasury and other government, um, you know, other governments around the world are doing? 
correct me if I'm wrong here, but what the Fed, particularly what the Fed is doing, is providing liquidity and providing credit. And the Treasury, to a certain degree, is providing some demand replacement, but it certainly can't fill the hole that's, that we're going to see created over the course of the second quarter. Help us sort of sort through what the Fed and the Treasury can and can't do you know, in terms of economic support and how that should be reflected in asset pricing. Okay. So, great question. So, let's talk, start with the Fed. I mean, one is, what is the Fed trying to do? They're trying to put money into the system to keep financial conditions at adequate levels so that businesses and individuals can transact. You had James Gorman talking about how he had to have operations working yesterday. Morgan Stanley needs to be in business. You need to have Bank of America. You need to have J.P. Morgan, all the uh, big private equity firms, everybody you can transact and credit to create markets. So, the Fed is trying to create good financial conditions. They're doing that. Uh, by buying, um, obviously, treasuries, by mortgages, and they've started to uh, move into investment grade. The second thing is then you need to, once you calm financial conditions, which I think they've done a, a significant job of doing, you need to have a fiscal response. And if you think about the unemployment benefits, they average out to about $28 per hour, and that's uh, essentially what um, the middle-income America makes per hour. So they're essentially creating a bridge during this uncertain period. And so uh, kudos to the, to the Treasury for doing that. Ultimately, when you look at the plan, it's really three-pronged. The investment-grade program is for the, you know, really the big companies to keep them in business. The small business uh, loans are to the, you know, the very small companies. And then you have the Main Street Act in the middle, which really is trying to help those. It's not going to work perfectly overnight. That's why you've seen the unemployment rate spike so high. But ultimately, the intentions are, are pure. Um, but what we're trying to do is essentially create a bridge where we know or, or, or smooth, you know, create foam on the, on, on the road so that it's smooth. But we know there's a massive pothole, right? This pothole, we're talking about a peak to trough GDP of, of 12 percent, which is, um, you know, three times what we saw uh, during the great financial crisis. So we are optimistic we will get to the other side. I think the, the news you heard overnight in Gilead, our view is, is that the econ economy will o open up but it will open up in a rolling format. And unfortunately, what you've seen, you know, a lot of people like to hold China out there as this recovery model, but look at what's going on in Hong Kong and Singapore. Um, cases have actually ticked up back in the United States. So this is not going to be uh, perfect science. And the, the peak number of cases in China and South Korea, it took about three weeks to go from peak cases down to less than 100, or, or about 10 percent of their total cases. If you look at other countries, and you can use Italy as an example, we're still seven weeks um, in, and we haven't bent the curve. So there was a lot of discussion the past four weeks about you know, bending the curve on the way up. But what, what really needs to happen now is you need to bend the curve on the way down. But our view is, is that social distancing, e even, even if the, the drug coming out of Gilead is successful, it still doesn't fix the social distan distancing issue. And so the economy is going to look different. And so our view is you're going to see a lot of uh, transfer of economic uh, value creation. You, you're seeing this from in real estate. You're seeing this in traditional retail to e-commerce. That's a clear theme. You're going to see changes in, in the way education is done. You're going to see changing in, in behavior patterns um, around the way people think about value concepts and the way they think about health and wellness. Think about ESG and, and what the KKR does there. I mean, we've been doing lots around um, food safety, but you're also going to have um, safety around health care now. And so that, that those type of things are all efforts we're working on, but it's happening against a backdrop where nationalism is surging. And so in some of our prior interviews, you and I have talked about technology being a, 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 a strategic priority for the United States, but also one for China. But that, that, that sector has just expanded into areas such as health care and other areas. So I think we're in for um, a recovery. I think we can compliment the governments and the Fed for the work they've done in the ECB. But um, there's always a transition. You get a big shock down. You get a big move back up. And then you have a sawtooth pattern where the economic reality, unfortunately, you know, pulls you back down a little bit. The offset is you're going to get a cure and you're going to get liquidity and fiscal response. And so we've become what, you know, we kind of moved from phase one where, and I think you guys reported on this, we were very aggressive probably understated some of the numbers, but, 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 but I would say that we were very aggressive around deploying 
um, into the, the downturn on the higher quality. Now we're moving into phase two, and phase two will be a rolling dislocation. And so we've been forming capital around that, and it, it really speaking to you know, using our lens across Asia, across Europe, and across our sectors to find things where we can partner with companies that either need to delever or they need to, you know, maybe a good company, bad capital structure, or ultimately they want to grow. And so it's really a two-pronged attack in, in phase two. Phase two is uh, partner with secular winners who you think are going to come out of that. And I listed some themes, and there's more in the note. And then the second is to really partner with companies that need to deleverage because what I talked about, which is we enter the downturn with peak margins and peak leverage, right? And globally today, when you look at total debt as a percentage of global GDP, it's about 250 or 60 percent. Um, in 2007, going into that downturn, it was 210 percent. So that theme of deleveraging is going to be with us for, for years, not days.